Hello, and welcome to Rock Creek Online. Thank you for joining us today. In just a moment, we're going to hear a great talk. But first, take a minute and let us know where you're watching from. As you watch today, we want you to know that we've been praying for you, and we believe God is going to speak to you through today's teaching. Just a reminder, if you're ever in the Marysville area, we would love for you to join us in person for church. But for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy today's teaching. And thank you for making Rock Creek a part of your spiritual growth. Hey, Rock Creek Church, Pastor Brian here. We're so glad you joined us. Uh, wherever you're watching from, whether our YouTube, Facebook page, our website, make sure you look for the link, download some notes. Uh, trust me, uh, this week when you forget what I said, you can go back to your notes, uh, whether they're on your phone or you're actually you're old school and you got like a piece of paper that you write on. Uh, make sure you take some good notes today. This is our final installment of our teaching series called We Are The Church. And uh, this has been a really fun series. Hopefully uh, you've grown spiritually. Hopefully you've been challenged in your faith, whether it's in regards to water baptism. We baptized, I think, 10 people a few weeks ago. Whether it's talking about remembering uh, the Lord's table, we also know that as communion. Uh, this last weekend, our very own Amy, our worship director, spoke about worship. So what it means to be a worshiper, making sure it's not just about singing songs or the fact that we can't sing, we don't worship, but actually making it a life that's offered to God. And so today, one of the main elements that makes a church a church is the word of God, the Bible, scripture. And so we thought we would end this teaching series with kind of a final exclamation point going, hey, by the way, your life needs to be anchored to God's word. And for some of you Christians, you, you, know, you read your Bible every day or you've studied your Bible front to back, like this is gonna be some review, but it's gonna be some challenging thoughts that maybe you haven't actually um, uh, uh, participated in your own spiritual practice. Uh, and for those of you who are new, maybe you've never even been to church, maybe you're watching online for the first time, maybe someone invited you on social media, uh, this is gonna be super helpful for you to really understand what Rock Creek Church and what every Bible-believing church should be about. So here's our uh, theme scripture out of Matthew chapter four. It says, but Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus is having this moment where he's being tempted to do contrary to what God's best is. He said, hey, it's not about what you eat or drink, it's actually about getting a word from God. We call that the Bible or scripture. Matthew 7, 24 says it this way. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Now I don't know about you, but I wanna be wise. I wanna make sure I'm making the right decisions, doing the right things, when, when, whenever God leads me in every area of my life. He says, if you follow it, you'll be wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Now, if you've never read your Bible, in this context, there's two homes being built, one on the rock, one on the beach, and the one on the beach gets, gets broken, the one on the rock withstands the storm. And so uh, I would assume, like me, you want your life to stand in the middle of the storms that we go through. And so if you follow God's word, you'll be wise and you'll be like the person who built on the rock. So when the storms come, you won't actually have issues. Luke 11 says it this way. Jesus replied, but even more blessed are all who hear the word of God and put it into practice. That means you live it out. You don't just listen to it, you don't just hear it, you don't just see it, but you actually follow it. You look at it and go, you know what? It's not just enough that I heard the words, but I'm going to live out the words. Now, now here's the challenging part. Uh, I was a pretty good student growing up. Okay, now think about you as a student, maybe some of you are like, you don't even know how old I am, Pastor Brian. That's a long, like think about you as a student. Some of you are good students, some of you were not so good of students. And I'll, I'll never forget, math was really hard for me. We have our kids now in school, and, uh, and I'll be honest, I'm having like, just like flashbacks to me not doing well in math as my kid who's in second grade is like, hey dad, I need you to help me with my math today. I'm like, oh, oh, oh. that's, but you know what I got? I got what's called a tutor, why? Because I just didn't get it. I didn't understand it. And so when it came to geometry and trigonometry and algebra and algebra and calculus and all these crazy words and diagrams and, and angles and you know all this stuff, I, it was over my head. And so I got my uncle, who was a math genius. 
He worked for a very large aerospace company here in the Northwest and was brilliant when it came to math. And so it only took a few weeks of him explaining it to me where all of a sudden I went from I don't get it to I got it. I understand it. I'm, I'm able to accomplish and finish the task and understand so that I could eventually use a computer or an iPhone to calculate everything that I need. Come on, how many are thankful for the iPhone? You don't have to do math by hand anymore. The TI 93s or 82s or whatever they were, like an iPhone is so much easier. But for a brief moment, I had to actually do it on real paper but it was over my head. I didn't get it, I didn't understand it. So I had to get someone to help me who was better, who understood it, who could help me understand how everything worked together so I could get the results I wanted, which was to pass high school. (laughs) And eventually I got help even in college. And, And many times churches do a bad job of helping people understand the Bible. And so, for many of you, maybe watching it, you're like, I've never read the Bible, or maybe you've tried to read the Bible, you're like, oh my goodness, the Bible is, I just don't get it. Which is why I entitled this talk, I Don't Get It. Because for some of us, we don't read the Bibles, we don't engage with scripture or God's word because we just don't get it. And that's why you need to be in church. Because my job and the other pastors and leaders here at Rock Creek is to help you get it. Just like I needed help with my algebra and trigonometry and calculus in advance. Like, I needed help, you need help. And so our job is to help you understand God's word, apply it to your life, so that ultimately you can be transformed. So that ultimately you can grow in your faith. So at the end of the day, your life looks more like Jesus, not less. And one of the primary ways we as the church, besides worship, besides communion, besides water bath, is that we anchor our life to God's word, the Bible, scripture. And uh, I thought it would be important for us to, to really just be honest today. For some of us Christians, it's been a while since we've cracked our Bibles or opened our phones to read our Bibles or nowadays they have apps that read the Bible to you. It's been a while. Maybe the only time you digest God's word, that means you read it, you intake, is actually here at Rock Creek. Well, I thought it would be appropriate to talk about some reasons why we don't read our Bible. So we're gonna get real and we're gonna be honest and I'm gonna hit you right where you are today. Hopefully one of these will will kind of get in your heart and go, oh man, yeah, that's definitely why. And then I'm gonna help you get to where God wants you to be, which is anchored to his word. So here's, here's the first reason why I think we don't read our Bibles. Number one, it makes us uncomfortable. It makes us uncomfortable. Now, uh, when we used to fly all the time, I used to fly a little bit, and I'll never forget, I was flying from Atlanta to Charlotte, Charlotte to Seattle. And our flight from Atlanta to Charlotte uh, was delayed. And so we got there and we ran. Now if you've ever flown or uh, like sometimes there's just gates that are super, super far away and Atlanta is a massive airport. It was three miles and we got there finally and then it was late to Charlotte so everything was delayed. So I had had a really good, what's called a free upgrade, come on. And so I got, had gotten a free upgrade from Charlotte to Seattle because it's about a five and a half hour flight. Well because our flight was l- delayed and late, guess what I lost? my seat assignment. So on this big plane, I don't remember what it was, but it was big, 38 rows. And guess what Pastor Brian got? 38A. Now I'll tell you, never sat in 38A. I wanted to be in whatever it was before, which was above 20. (laughs) Uh, The back seat of the plane didn't actually recline. Now, you may not be like me, but I'm a little bit sensitive when it comes to uh, roller coasters, amusement park rides, and so in the back of a large plane going across from east to west, it's a little bumpy. And if you sit in the back of the plane, you feel more of the waves. And so I, here I am in 38A with no recline, sitting next to the restroom, come on, and the plane was rocking and rolling. And so when I got home and I laid my head in bed, I thought, my gosh, I'm on a, I'm on a boat. And the place was moving. Like, why? I was uncomfortable the entire five and a half hours. And sometimes, us as Christians, or maybe not, you've cracked your Bible, maybe you're not even a Christian, you're like, dude, I don't like what this Bible does because it makes me uncomfortable. But, but that's part of the goal is to provoke you to go, you know what, I need a change. Just like I wish I could have changed my seat assignment. Why, because I was uncomfortable? 
The Bible is to provoke us, compel us, encourage us to change. Why? So that we can be a little bit more like Jesus, which causes us to to get out of our comfort zone. 2 Timothy 3 says it this way, all scripture is inspired by God and useful to teach us what is true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare. Another word for prepare is develop and equip his people to do every good work. So here is our basis for anchoring our life to God's word. It's gonna help us do a few things and here's the first thing it's gonna do. It's gonna teach us truth. And so what makes us uncomfortable about truth is that we live in a culture that's trending towards your truth is your truth. Like there is no absolute, whatever you feel is right, go for it. Whatever you think is accurate, that must be right for you, but it may not be right for me. And I'm here to tell you, we do not trend with culture, we trend towards Christ. And God's word is our true north, our absolute truth. In a world that says there is no absolutes, I'm here to tell you that's not true. (laughs) It actually is absolute. God's word teaches us what's true. It it, it reimagines our life in such a way that goes, actually what you're doing is not truth, it's false. And so make a change. Change your seat assignment. And you know what that does? It makes us uncomfortable. Psalm 33 says it this way, for the word of the Lord holds true and we can trust everything he does. Psalms 18.30 says it this way, God's way is perfect, all the Lord's promises prove true, he is a shield for all who look to him for protection. You know what the, the word of the Lord shields you from? False living, false believing, false stories that you tell yourself that actually are not true. Listen friend, your truth is not your truth. What you see in celebrity culture, what you see in trending in actual Western culture, where everyone has a truth and they follow it. It's wrong. It's not the way that God intended us to live. He intended us to follow his ways because why? They're perfect. His promises prove true and he'll shield us from what's not true. Psalm 119 says it this way, how can a young person stay pure? By obeying your word. Another word for pure is holy. And God says this, it's not in your notes, but he says this, be holy because I'm holy. And so as Christians who are pursuing to follow Jesus must understand that the way we stay pure, the way we stay holy is by following what? God's word, which makes us uncomfortable because we realize that the truth we think we were living wasn't actually true. Another reason why it makes us uncomfortable is that it actually what's called, it reproves us. Okay, now reprove is a, is a great uh, word more accurately describing 2 Timothy 3, which we read earlier, that all scripture, it reproves us. That means it like corrects us and realigns us when we worship something other than God or we give our allegiance to something other than God. Exodus 20 says it this way, you must not have any other God but me. So what does that mean, Pastor Brian? It sounds good, I know it's part of those fancy 10 commandments, but like what does that actually mean? That you are to give your allegiance. That means your life to God and God alone. You are to worship God and God alone. Amy did a great job preaching last weekend and teaching, and she says this, that you were created for worship. So you will worship something or someone, and the something and someone that you were created to worship is God is God, not success, not a spouse, not your kids, not your bank account, not your accomplishments, not your accolades, but God of the Bible. That's who we are to worship. And so when we worship something other than God, the word of God should reprove us. It corrects us, it it moves us. Matthew six says it this way, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. So we gotta be careful that we don't worship something other than God. Here's the other reason why it makes us uncomfortable is it corrects us. It corrects us. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but I don't like to be corrected. In my human 
my humanness. I don't like to be corrected, I like to be right. And you're probably like me, you, you like to be right too. No one likes to be corrected, which is why sometimes when we read God's word, it makes us uncomfortable because it, it tells us where we're missing the mark. We call that sin. So God has a best practice in all areas of our life and when we miss that mark, it's called sin. And so the word of God, the Bible, scripture is meant to correct us in the same way that if you were to curb your tire or wheel on a something, a rock, a pothole, and then the car starts shaking, why? It's out of alignment, typically. And so the word of God helps us realign our life so that we follow God's best for it. Now some of us, maybe have been raised in church, we like to cherry pick scriptures that are good. We like to cherry pick scriptures that help us affirm what we're already doing. But I'm here today as your pastor to tell you that you have to take the whole scripture. Why? Because Second Timothy told us all scripture is inspired. And so when we read all the scriptures, it's going to pinpoint some areas of our life that are out of alignment. So then we have to allow us to get uncomfortable because it what? The word of God corrects. First Thessalonians four. God's will is for you to be holy. Now I wish it would just end it there. Okay, be holy, all that sounds good, but, but then it, it gets specific, why? For corrective purposes. So stay away from all sexual sin. Okay, Pastor Brian, it's too early for you to just go there with that big sledgehammer of God's word, right? You know what's funny? I didn't put it in your notes. It, it may not be funny to you because this might be where you're living, but the word of God is likened to a hammer. And, and for some of us, we need the hammer of God's word to go, boom, wake up. How you're living, how you're, come on, living is not God's best. Be holy. Make sure that how you're living when it comes to your sexuality is lining up with God's word. Why did you pick this topic for this first password? Why, because I think it's the number one struggle we're seeing in culture that's trending towards your truth is your truth. And I'm here to tell you in all love with no shame attached that God created sex for marriage, reserved, held together. One man, one woman made covenant before God. And so if you're doing that outside of what I just explained, it's time to follow God's word. Follow God's word, and here's what I'll tell you. We all have missed the mark at some point in our life. So again, hear me, no shame attached, but corrective in nature to go, oh man, I'm not doing life that way. And so the word of God comes and goes, hey, 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 it's time to get realigned. It's time to go after God's best when it comes to not just our sexual preferences and desires and appetites, but every area of our life. Lying, greed, anger, respect, our words, our life. Psalm 119 says it this way, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. See, when you understand that God's word is corrective in nature, and our desire is to follow God, be more like Jesus, the only way to do that is by getting the word in our life. See, the heart is what makes you you. And so if you can get God's word in our heart, it can affect every area. See, it starts on the inside and works its way out. Get it in your heart. It will help you and correct you, but it will make you uncomfortable. Lastly, it makes us uncomfortable because it trains us. It trains us, it, it really, it, 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 the word is disciple. It helps us know how to follow correctly. First Peter two says it this way. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment. Like, like, you need to be trained into what God wants you to be. 
you have to start like a baby does with milk, and then eventually you grow up and you get the full meal deal. John 8 says it this way. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you what? Remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. One of our values at Rock Creek is to find freedom. And the only way to find freedom is making sure that your truth is not your truth, but your truth is God's truth. And then God's truth will take your life. It will make you uncomfortable by teaching you, correcting you, reproving you, and helping you be trained to be more like Jesus. And so as Christians, as we talk about what it means to be the church, we have to go, our life is anchored to God's word, which makes us uncomfortable, but we're willing to embrace being uncomfortable because we know it will help us follow God's best for our life. And the end result, friends, is that we look and live and love like Jesus. Here's another main big reason people don't read the Bible. Number two, it's too hard. It's too hard, it's like, oh my gosh, there's stuff I don't understand, there's context, there's history, the ins and outs of all these families and genealogies, and you're like, it's overwhelming to me, I get all that. But as a Christian, there comes a point where I want to desire to know more about God. And the greatest way to know more about God is by getting into his word. Philippians says it this way, do everything without complaining, even, we'll get to it, and arguing so that no one could criticize you live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world fully or full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, listen, you have to hold firm of God's word. Got to hold firm to it. And the reality is it makes it difficult when we don't understand it. And, and, and when it's too hard, the context, history, come on. Some of you have tried to read Leviticus before and you're like, I'm giving up. This whole Bible thing. And see, only in the Western world, I, I feel like we give up a little too early when it comes to the Bible. And so if you're new to church, you're new to Rock Creek, don't start in Leviticus and the Old Testament because some of you can't get past Genesis 6, right? He's like, this whole flood and the ark and Noah, like, listen, start in the Gospel of John where you see Jesus at work. So don't let it be too hard, or the context and the historical stuff that you may not understand, which is why you need to be in church. It's why you should join a group, so that a pastor and leader can help you walk it out, just like I needed help in trigonometry, and calculus, and algebra. You may need help so that it becomes less hard and more wisdom and understanding. Number three, I think this is why we don't read our Bibles, is that we are actually undisciplined. We're undisciplined in the spiritual habits of what's most important. First Timothy four says it this way. Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, what? Train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. Promising benefits in this life and the life to come. The life to come. See, uh, if we are really honest together, like we make time for what's most important. I know I hear it a lot, oh I'm just so busy, I'm just so busy, life is busy, we're in a pandemic, it's busy, it's crazy, uh, between kids, sports, school, grandparents, COVID, like it's just so busy, right? I just, uh, it's hard to have time to get in the Bible, it's, you know, it's a little too hard and I'm not sure I understand it and it makes me uncomfortable. Listen, we make time for what's most important. You make time to eat, right? You, you, you make time to, come on, whatever your hobby is. Like I make time for what's important. Like I make sure I, I try to get out in the golf and if you, if you live in the Northwest, you understand that's hard because it's always raining and cloudy and not fun in the rain. But like I make time for what's most important and so here's what I wanna challenge you. Being undisciplined is not a good reason to stay out of God's word. What you gotta do is go, you know what, it's really important it's part of the thing that anchors my life and gets me into God's truth, not my truth or the world's truth, is, is reading God's word, then I, then I want that. I'm gonna make myself disciplined like an athlete does physical training. I'm gonna do the spiritual training. I'm gonna live a disciplined life, a life that's under control, a life that's yielded to God's word and his spirit so I can grow spiritually strong. 
See, you have to remember that you are first a spirit before you are a body. This life will end and you will go on and you will spend somewhere forever. So you have to remember that physical training is good. I want you to eat right and be healthy, but make time for what's most important, which is to be spiritually healthy, to grow spiritually strong, to be spiritually vibrant, because here's what I know to be true. If you are spiritually vibrant, growing in your faith, you can go through the hardest of times and still come out shining. So don't let the scriptures overwhelm you because they're too hard, and definitely don't use the fact that you are a little bit out of touch with spiritual practice and disciplines to keep you out of God's word. Here's another big reason. A lot of people, I hear this all the time, it's stale and lifeless. Like, Brian, God's word, it's not really that relevant. I mean, it was written thousands of years ago by all these different people, and you think it's inspired by God? Like, is it really helpful for my life in the 21st century? And the answer emphatically, every single day and twice on Sunday, yes, it's still relevant. Hebrews 4 says it this way, for the word of God is alive and powerful, It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between the joint and marrow of your life. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. What is the scripture telling us? Hey, the word of God is important because it's gonna gonna cut out some things that need to be cut out. It's gonna correct some things that need to be corrected and it it will expose the areas that aren't aligned with God's word. And so we have to make sure we don't go, oh man, it's just not that relevant. I'd rather go to the self-help section at the Amazon bookstore and find out how I can be a better leader, how I can be a better parent, how I can be a better dad, how I can start my own business, how I can be a, the millionaire next door. No, no, what you need to do is find out how you grow closer to God. And when you grow closer to God, all the other stuff will fall in place. So the Bible's not stale, the Bible's not boring. You know what we say in our family whenever our kids say, you know, dad, I'm bored. And and I said, listen, we don't don't use those words in this family. I said, you're not bored, we're not bored. And and so I I, I literally tell them they cannot say that. Go find something to do, be creative. And so here's what I'll say about the Bible. Okay, lovingly as your pastor, uh, the Bible's not boring, you might be boring. Like if you actually read the Bible, it gets pretty dang interesting, especially in the Old Testament. Like you see some stuff that would be in like the, the movies that you go out and watch or the, the Netflix shows that you binge on, like that's in the Bible. Uh, you just ha- haven't gotten into it yet. Like the Bible's not boring, but you might be. And so I want to encourage you, get into God's word. It's alive, it's powerful. It can change your life by what? Cutting out the stuff that needs to be cut out and adjusting the things that need to be adjusted, and ultimately helping you grow in your relationship with God to know him greater today than you did yesterday. But here's the most, I think, prominent reason people don't read their Bible, specifically Christians, because our relationship with God is actually dysfunctional. Our relationship with God is actually dysfunctional. Let me explain what I mean. My wife, who has the most beautiful handwriting like ever, if you've ever received a card from her or, or, or maybe you've received a card from me, like wow, Pastor Brian can really, <laughs> he's got some calligraphy. My wife probably wrote it, okay? Hate to break the news to you. Like beautiful handwriting. And so I have a, we've been married 15 years and I have a bin of cards that she has written me over the years. Like if I had it up here, it would be huge. I mean, just filled with cards and encouragement. I'm an I'm a affirmation kind of guy, so she writes cards and tells me how proud she is and an amazing wife. But it would be like, if for the last 15 years she would give me cards and I just put them in the bin, but I never read them. Like, and then I brought it today to our talk and said, look at all these amazing cards my wife has written me. I mean, can't you imagine how much she loves me? Well, what has she written in them? I, I don't know, I, I've never opened them. He'd be like, uh, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Open them up. It's like when my kids get gifts. And they don't want to read the card, why? Because a couple of them can't read. They just want to open up the gift. But it's the words in the card that set up the expression of love for the gift that you receive. 
And it's the same way in our relationship with God. Some of us have a dysfunctional relationship with God because we never read God's word, so we don't understand how much he loves us, how big of a purpose he has for our life, how great of a calling he has for us, how great his grace is for us, how kind he wants to be, how he wants to provide and redeem and forgive and take the shame and guilt off your life and give you the righteousness that only he can give you to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. But because we refuse, for a variety of reasons, to get into God's word, the Bible, the scriptures, we have a dysfunctional relationship with God. Why? Because we've never opened the card. We don't know what he's saying. We see it. We hear Pastor Brian talk about the Bible, but we're not quite sure what's in it. I wrote it this way, and I I hope it sticks with you today. We cannot separate a love for the word of God and the God of the word. We can't separate them. Like if you love the word of God, you'll love the God of the word. And if you love God, you have to love his word. The same way that I love my wife, I have to love what she writes to me, and so when she gives me a card, I'm like, I wonder what she's saying about me. I wonder what encouragement I'm gonna get today. And that is the story of scripture. We cannot separate the word of God from the God who lives in the word. But you know, here's the honest truth. Jeremiah 17, and it makes it very clear. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Here's the honest truth. This is the human condition on display. Even at our best, the heart is wicked. Even at our best, our heart trends away from God instead of towards God. For some of you watching today, you're not a Christian, and you heard all this great discussion about the Bible, and maybe some of that, those points about why we don't read our Bible is connected with you, and maybe that's why you've never stepped into faith before. Or maybe you're a Christian, you're like, man, I, do, I believe all those things. It makes me uncomfortable. I, I, I don't want to be corrected. I don't want to be trained. It's too hard. I don't understand the whole Old Testament and New Testament. and it, it just. But how are you going to know truth? How are you going to be connected to your creator? Because your, your heart and my heart is desperately wicked. We were born with a propensity to move away from God, not towards God, so so here's what I want for all of us. I want us to repent and turn to Jesus. That word repent literally means to change the way we are going by changing our thinking. So we, we go, you know what, if the heart is truly wicked, then I need a new heart, and Jesus says, if you believe in me, I'll transform you from the inside out, and then you'll have a desire, a want to, to know God, which means you'll have a desire, want you to anchor your life to God's word. So it can teach you and train you, correct you and reprove you. Why? So you can be more like Jesus. So today, whether you're a Christian or not, maybe there's some areas in your life that you need to repent from, you need to turn from and turn towards God, which will lead you to developing daily spiritual habits, like reading your Bible, like worshiping God, like praying, we call it the first 15 that you would wake up in the morning and give the first part of your day to the Lord. And why, by that I mean you give five minutes of worship, five minutes of prayer, and five minutes of reading God's word. And as you develop those daily, not every once in a while or every other Tuesday, right, daily spiritual habits, you'll grow in your love for God. Why, because you're getting his word in you, you're communing him through prayer, and you're honoring God with your life by worshiping him. And here's the last thing. I I think if you want to anchor your life to God's word, you have to focus on the why, not the what. See, the what is that you would read your Bible. But that's not why we read it. As Christians, we can become this like self-focused person, like, look, I just checked that off the box. I read my Bible today. Can I tell you, I know a lot of people who say they cl- or claim to read their Bibles every day, but they are mean. They are not like Jesus. They are not full of hope and faith and grace and kindness. Because it's not just about what you're doing, it's why you're doing it. I don't read the Bible just because that's what I'm supposed to do. I read my Bible, why? Because I want to know God more. 
And so I focus on the why. As I read God's word, it begins to read my life and it corrects me. It teaches me what is truth. It develops me by training me in righteous thinking and living. Why? So I can be on mission, that I can fulfill God's purpose for my life. And as we do this together, the world will not direct us, God's word will direct us. And I end with this thought, if you wanna know what God's will is for your life, get into God's word for your life. And as you do that, you will be in alignment with God's best for you in every area of your life. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for every single person watching. In this moment, I pray now you would help us, you would convict us, you'd transform us, you'd change us. God, for many of us watching, we haven't cracked the Bible or looked at the Bible on the phone in a long time, but I pray today we would repent, we would turn to Jesus, we would develop daily spiritual routines of getting into your word, and the word would transform our life. So I pray transformation for every single person watching right now in your mighty name, Jesus, and everyone watching said amen. I'm so glad you joined us wherever you're watching from. Again, thank you for joining us. I always encourage our church at this time in our service to partner with us financially. As you give today, your giving is not only helping the essentials of our church to function, but to continue to broadcast the gospel everywhere that we can. Thank you so much for your generosity. You can look for the link. If you're making a spiritual step today, look for rockcreek.online slash next. And as always, Rock Creek, you're doing better than you think. God bless.